Good morning, and welcome to the United States uh, Institute for uh, Peace. Uh, I am Johnny Carson, Senior Advisor at USIP, and I will serve as uh, this morning's uh, moderator for our program on Somalia. Uh, I am also uh, extraordinarily pleased to be able to introduce our guests uh, this morning. Ambassador Nicholas Kay, who uh, is the head of the United Nations Assistance Mission in Somalia, and also the UN Secretary General's special representative for that country. Somalia is undergoing a slow and steady political and security transformation. For most of the past two and a half decades, Somalia has been used and held up as a classic example of a failed state. A country without a functioning government, economy, or security apparatus. A lawless country incapable of protecting its people, its borders, or its natural resources. And a country that has generated problems for its regional neighbors and also for the international community. A mere five years ago, at the beginning of 2009, the situation in Somalia appeared to be at its lowest point, and many observers had clearly written it off. Ethiopian troops who had been fighting against extremists had been driven out of the country. The transitional federal government at the time led by President Abdullah Yusuf Ahmad was in chaos and he was about to step down and a group called El Shabaab, uh, a radical element of the Islamic Courts Union was spreading its rule across the country including the capital Mogadishu. The then TFG had control of probably less than one square mile of the city in and around Villa Somalia. But the past five years have seen an enormous amount of change, an enormous amount of progress. Today the transitional federal government is no longer there. The former president, Hassan Sheikh, stepped down. There is a new provisional constitution, a new president, a new prime minister, and tremendous and growing international support. On the military side, by AMISOM, led by Uganda, but also including troops from Burundi, Ethiopia, Kenya, and as far away as Sierra Leone. We have seen Al-Shabaab pushed out of Mogadishu, out of Kismayu, and many of the major towns and cities in South Central. At the same time, we have seen a sharp decrease uh, in the level of piracy off the coast of Somalia in the Red Sea. There has been change, and Somalia looks different from the way it did five years ago, 10 years ago, or 20 years ago. Today we have with us the person who is most responsible for the <coughs> conduct of the United Nations 
operations on the ground in Somalia today. Ambassador uh, Nick Kay. Ambassador uh, Kay uh, has uh, a distinguished uh, diplomatic background, a former British uh, ambassador to uh, the Sudan, and also later to the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uh, I can think of no better person to be conducting the business of the UN and the international community than uh, Ambassador Kay. Uh, experienced, wise, uh, and uh, knows uh, how to operate in very tough political and security uh, environments. Uh, in my last uh, position at the Department of State, uh, Nick and I uh, were colleagues. Uh, we talked uh, on a weekly basis and sometimes on a daily basis. Uh, we have traveled across uh, Central Africa uh, together doing uh, difficult uh, lifting uh, on uh, the DRC and Rwanda and Uganda uh, and other places. Uh, so it is a great honor for me to be able to uh, ask uh, uh, Ambassador Kay, a good friend, uh, to talk uh, about how he sees the current situation in Somalia and whether uh, the uh, slow, uh, steady uh, progress that I mentioned uh, is in fact uh, real or is it a mirage? Uh, where is uh, Somalia today and where uh, do we expect it to be next year uh, and the year after? Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to invite Ambassador Kay to make some remarks. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Johnny, for those uh, extremely kind uh, words. And thank you very much indeed to USIP for inviting me. Um, it's a great pleasure to be in this magnificent building. Uh, a great pleasure to see uh, so many people here attest to continuing strong interest in Somalia. And I can see also in the audience several familiar faces as well. Um, uh, some of whom have served with me in, in Somalia in the, in the mission or visited recently. Uh, and I also acknowledge a former British ambassador to Sudan as well in the audience as well. <laughs> Alan Gulty is a yes. uh, yeah. former colleague. Good to see. So it's, uh, I feel as if I'm amongst uh, friends and therefore, of course, I will speak frankly and, and freely and deeply conscious that this is also being webcast and, <laughs> <laughs> and that my... My, my job probably hangs on the line, so um, <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not going to speak from a, from a script, although I have an extremely good script prepared by my extremely good team in, in the United Nations, um, but I will just uh, elaborate a few comments off, uh, off uh, the cuff, as it were, um, and very much look forward to opening to questions and, and discussion, because you know, I'm always here and traveling to listen as much as to, to speak, uh, because there is a lot of collective knowledge and, and wisdom in the room, uh, which it would be rash of me to leave today without having fully exploited. So I look forward to, to that part of the, the meeting. Um, but uh, let, me, let me start. I mean, the, 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 the title, I think, that I was given, which is great, because I didn't have to think of it, but it's, it's a very good title. Um, Somalia, progress or peril, or progress and peril, I'm not quite sure, but, uh, uh, but I mean, which captures exactly what sort of Johnny was framing in his opening comments, and it's something which, as the SRSG, uh, I spend a lot of my time having to field the, the question, you know, well, How's it going with a Somalia? Are you optimistic? Um, and you know, all those sort of rather, rather difficult questions. Um, and it is a difficult sort of uh, set of questions because it's, yeah, I mean, there's, I could just stop now actually and say, I mean, essentially there is progress and that progress is in peril. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, you know, both, both of the above are, are true. Um, it's not, a, not an either or option. 
Um, September 2012, um, Johnny and I were both, yes, doing our respective jobs in our, in our foreign ministries, uh, supposedly overseeing quite a lot of sub-Saharan Africa business, and we were, we were all elated, I think there's no doubt about it, the end of the transition in September 2012, the election selection uh, of uh, Hassan Sheikh Mahmoud, civil society leader, not a former warlord, not a, you know, sort of somebody who came with uh, good credentials. It really felt like the dawn of a, of a new sort of age. Um, and yeah, hopes were very, very high. Uh, I imagine really unrealistically high. Um, and now, 18 months later, uh, the fact that those high hopes are now tinged with harsh realism, I think is only normal and natural. I mean, I don't think uh, we should be particularly uh, surprised. Um, the going is tough. In the last 18 months, the federal government, Hassan Sheikh Mahmoud's experience there, um, coincided with the end of the UN uh, UNPOS mission, the beginning of our mission last June. Uh, I've traveled a little bit of the road with Hassan Sheikh Mahmoud and his government, 10 months, and yeah, I can attest to it, it's pretty tough going. Now, what is you know tough about it, I think really comes as no, no surprise, and we're more or less in the same boat as the international community and the federal government. We are faced with the same sets of challenges. Uh, the top of the list probably is security. Um, you know, this is a challenge. Al-Shabaab is a determined, uh, ruthless enemy with a lot of intent and quite a lot of capability. And they use it against the federal government and they use it against the United Nations uh, and anybody from the international community who's there to help. They're very non-discriminating. They do not discriminate between humanitarians and political mission. Uh, they don't discriminate really between nationalities. The Turks are very high on their list of, uh, of targets as well as uh, Western non-Muslim non countries as well. Um, so we're all in the same boat, we're facing those challenges, an enemy that is determined to derail international support and assistance for Somalia and in determined to destabilize the government of Somalia. Um, so we share that challenge with the federal government. They find it very difficult to move around Mogadishu. They find it very difficult to move outside of Mogadishu. We as the international community find it so. We all travel in these wretched armored vehicles with pickups full of you know, guys with Kalashnikovs to protect us and things like that. Um, you know, we're, we're very much in the same boat there. We also face the same challenge of uh, weak or pretty well non-existent institutions, as Johnny said, you know, classic, fa well, the prototype of every failed state in the world, I think Somalia was. I think the, coin, the, 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 the phrase was coined to, to describe Somalia. Um, and so 23, 24 years of non-functioning state and very, very non-existent institutions on the whole. State presence, control, even in Mogadishu, let alone sort of around the, the rest of the country, very weak as well. That presents us as the international community a challenge. Development partners have that challenge. The government has the challenge. Lack of capacity, human capacity, you know, very, very weak within the, uh, within the ministries, institutions in Mogadishu. Two or three good people at the top of every ministry and then you know, nothing beneath it really on the whole. Um, and yeah. That's a challenge for a government wanting to deliver an ambitious program of jobs, health, education for their people. It's a problem for international partners trying to help them to do that. Uh, poverty, lack of resources, again, that's a challenge that faces us as internationals, it faces the, the country as well. It is often easy to forget just how poor Somalia is. I mean, it really, you know, economic figures are very, very uh, shaky in terms of reliability, but the one that always sticks in my mind is, you know, this is a government 
trying to run a country nearly the size of Afghanistan, nine million people, huge needs in terms of education, infrastructure, everything. And how much money does it get from its own resources to do that? It survives entirely off the revenue of the port in Mogadishu, really. And on a good month, the government gets $10 million a month from that. Um, that's gone up. It used to be about five million 12 months ago. So, you know, economic indicators are, are sort of positive. But that's that's the, the only money the government has to run itself. 120 million dollars a year from its own resources budget. I am sure that you know most department stores you know, on the corner of any Washington Street here have a you know higher <coughs> higher revenue than the federal government of Somalia. Um, so. Other problems that we share and that we face together, corruption, no doubt about it. You know, again, in the absence of functioning state institutions for the last 22 odd years, in a great competition for resources and survival, then yeah, corruption has been endemic uh, and, it's, uh, and it is still there in the system as well. Um, it's a problem that the federal government faces trying to root it out and we as internationals face that challenge too. Um, then, you know, clan, factionalism, huge uh, partisan sort of uh, political structures which have gained, have built up in the absence of state and functioning institutions, the absence of a democratic system. Uh, people have had to rely much more on clan over the last uh, 20 odd years. Um, and again, that presents challenge for the federal government, presents a challenge for us. Um, lots of challenges. What I find, in a way, slightly remarkable is that um, did we ever, I mean, why were we so hopeful in September 2012? You know, why was, you know, why was this a sort of great bubble of, uh, uh, of optimism and, I mean, I think all we have done now is, you know, put on our our realism hat, and and you know, why why did we ever think there would be no corruption after September 2012? Why did we ever think there would be no clan fighting and feuding after September 2012? Why did we ever think that suddenly you'd have a government and an administration that could deliver services and benefits to a bit? You know, why on earth did we think it was suddenly going to be uh, like that? You know, I think we're perhaps going through a period of collective uh, euphoria, or we were all smoking the wrong stuff. I don't know. <laughs> um, but. Uh, so, so we are, you know, we are where we are. The government, people of Somalia, the international community, United Nations, we face a whole series of really deeply challenging uh, circumstances, conditions in the country. Against that sort of background, well, are we making progress? Um, I think we are, and I'll go through just a little bit on the sort of the heading of security, uh, politics, um, international engagement and a little bit on uh, economy and financial governance. Um, and then, don't worry, I'll come back to the, to the negative stuff as well and I'll go through some, <laughs> some, some more of the perils uh, as I see them um, in the immediate context and then hopefully wrap up with just a little bit of, well, you know, so what and what, what do we do? Um, okay, rap running rapidly through progress. Security um, uh, is it? Yeah. Progress at the moment is dominated, obviously, by the offensive that's taking place across the country, uh, conducted by AMISOM and uh, the Somali National Army. And I certainly you know, pay tribute to to their efforts and their sacrifices, which we should not uh, ever neglect or forget the African Union have been prepared to put their troops, their sons and daughters in harm's way in a way which most international organizations and international uh, interventions do not do and uh, the Somali National Army are also fighting uh, very bravely alongside and clearly obviously both are taking losses and casualties. Um, but uh, so I think that is an important part of the equation, what's happening. 
when I arrived last June, one of my first questions really was, why is the offensive against Al-Shabaab stopped? Uh, and it had stopped. Um, why was, were towns no longer being taken, uh, uh, people moving forward? Uh, the answer, very simply, uh, I was told when I arrived was the lack of resources for Amazon. Uh, they needed more, they were overstretched. Uh, we, the UN and AU, took the precaution of actually sending some experts who understand these things better than SRSGs, who spent a good few weeks on the ground. September reported back, and yes, the answer was Amazon was overstretched and they needed more resources. Um, and the Security Council approved the uplift to Amazon in November of 4,000, just over 4,000 extra troops, uh, as well as uh, specifying the need for more enablers and force multipliers. Um, and significantly in that resolution also, authorized the UN to give non-lethal logistic support to the Somali National Army. So two sort of significant developments which have now fed through to enabling this offensive that officially started on the 3rd of March to, to get underway. And it's been pretty successful in the last uh, six, seven weeks that it's been going on. Uh, ten uh, population centers have been retaken from Al-Shabaab, many of them not involving direct fighting. Al-Shabaab uh, take the option of leaving. Uh, one or two have had to, had to be fought for. And this is quite an ambitious operation happening in a geographically spread area. At least three of the Amazon sectors are actively involved. Um, and it's benefiting from the Ethiopian forces now being incorporated in Amazon as part of that uplift. Um, it's, uh, it is at a stage, I understand, from my Amazon colleagues where they're consolidating that first phase and there's likely to be a second phase following on quite, uh, quite soon. Um, it's, uh, it's good. Now the government authority extends over significant uh, towns and uh, villages where it wasn't before. <laughs> Um, it's good because Al-Shabaab have been deprived sources of revenue. They get a lot of taxation from the towns they control. It's good because Al-Shabaab have been also deprived training bases. Um, in one of these towns, Bulubete, you may have seen on Al Jazeera TV a few months ago, there was a reportage done of a terrorist training camp, an Al-Shabaab training camp. Quite impressive. I was impressed. They had you know, two or three hundred people there being trained to be suicide bombers, slightly less impressed by the curriculum, but um, <laughs> uh, uh, and even less impressed when they interviewed the <laughs> spokesperson who d I think did mention my name as being <laughs> one, of, one, of the, one of the people that their students were particularly focusing on. Um, uh, but that, uh, that training camp now is, uh, is a Somali National Army base. Um, it's been you know, liberated, Al-Shabaab have been removed from Bulaberte and so yeah, so again, this is, you know, this is good. They're de being deprived of revenue, deprived of training place facilities, places where they can operate with impunity, uh, and this will go on. It brings with it challenges as well. I mean, there's no doubt that this operation is now presenting sort of second order challenges in terms of supply routes. Um, Al-Shabaab have left the towns, but they control the countryside. They're interfering with traffic and stopping food reaching some of these places, putting a great onus on helicopters and air supplies to resupply the Amazon forces, and we don't have enough helicopters. Um, but it's, it's a serious issue that we're facing now. Um, and uh, this is not just uh, civilian transport helicopters, which uh, UNSOA, the United Nations, uh, does need. But Amisom have no military helicopters whatsoever uh, and uh, therefore have no capability of protecting their supply routes from the air. And you know, it is remarkable to me and uh, deeply disturbing that uh, no African Union member state has come forward with helicopters for the African Union mission. I shall be in New York tomorrow and again repeating the same, same message um, that... Uh, Without that uh, military air support, Amazon are in peril, um, at least the success. 
Um, so that's going on. Meanwhile, you will have seen, unfortunately, uh, as a consequence of the offensive, Al-Shabaab have increased their activism in Mogadishu. Um, that was predicted, and it's been happening over the last couple of months. Um, and yesterday and today, uh, in successive days, they've assassinated a member of parliament each day in Mogadishu. Uh, a reminder from them that they're still capable, they're still there. A reminder from them that they are determined to undermine uh, the government, create the impression that the government hasn't got control. Um, and I think this will continue. Um, I'm not a great tactician, but I guess if I was an Al-Shabaab terrorist and I was under pressure being chased out of the towns and villages that I control, what would I try to do? Well, I would try to land some kind of strategic uh, punch in Mogadishu, unseat the government, particularly unseat the international community. If they could force the international community to retreat, then that would be a strategic uh, success for them. Uh, so I think we can expect them to, to continue to, to try and do that over the coming weeks. Um, that's security. Mixed picture, as I say. In general, Al-Shabaab are under pressure um, and uh, progress is being made, but it throws up challenges of sustainability, supply routes, etc., helicopters, and it throws up the sort of risk of the backlash from uh, Al-Shabaab, uh, particularly in Mogadishu. And it might be elsewhere too. They you know, may well, it, within the region also, uh, Kenya, Ethiopia, elsewhere, they may also try and uh, conduct attacks. Political progress. Are we doing that? Um, yes and no. Um, the big ticket items are... Somali uh, has committed itself in its provisional federal constitution to doing three things. One, forming itself into a federal state, and that means grouping together some of the regions, two or more, to form federal member states. Secondly, having a constitution that enshrines what a federal state is, a final constitution, which will be submitted to a referendum. Uh, and then thirdly, to have democratic, one person, one vote, elections across the whole country in 2016. Um, those are big ticket uh, challenges. Um, any one of those would be quite a challenge for most countries. Doing all three of those in a country in the context that I described at the beginning for uh, Somalia is, is outrageously ambitious. Um, however, is it doable? Um, I still firmly believe it is. Uh, we have two and a half years. I think we will have much clearer idea of whether it is doable, certainly by the end of this year, because uh, there is a draft framework of action for Vision 2016 that the government is preparing with a very tight timetable of exactly what needs to happen, by when, by whom, uh, and there is no, no real margin for slippage in that. Um, Parliament has now come back, is meeting in, uh, in Mogadishu. It has to enact several key pieces of legislation in this session or else we shall be off track. Um, so we will know quite soon whether this outrageously ambitious project is, is going to be doable or not. Um, but at this stage, there is no reason uh, to say that it can't be done. Um, meanwhile, apart from having this plan of action for achieving these three major big ticket items, there is a outbreak, if you like, across Somalia of free market um, uh, free market bidding process to become federal member states. Uh, so on the ground, people are taking the initiative to set up their own federal states uh, without waiting for a federal government-led orderly process. Um, so we have 
currently, as many of you will know, a dispute in Baidoa between those advocating a three-region and those advocating a six-region federal state, which is uh, a difficult, uh, difficult issue. Uh, we still have the implementation of the Juba Interim Administration Agreement, which is uh, taking time to, to work through. And then we've had sort of other freelance initiatives where Shabeli, Lower Shabeli, Middle Shabeli declared that they wanted to be a state and they had a president. There was a few weeks ago when it seemed like more or less every other day a new president was appointed <laughs> somewhere. Um, there seemed to be a, a growth industry in, in being self-appointed presidents. Um, but, you know, that's, you know, that's fine. What is encouraging, I think, now is that the federal government is, is taking more of a uh, proactive and leading role on this. Um, it's stuck between, it can't be directive and it can't be imposed from Mogadishu. It has to be a process that takes account of uh, views and feelings at the local level and of the different stakeholders. But nor can it be completely laissez-faire and free market. There has to be some structure to it, especially if they're going to reach the timetable of, by the end of this year, forming the new provisional federal map of Somalia with all the provisional interim federal member states formed. Uh, so certainly we as the UN are supporting, encouraging now a slightly more structured uh, approach to this uh, and we will see how we get on. I think, you know, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that we can reach that uh, goal by the end of this year of uh, Somalis having decided their new federal uh, map. Um, final, uh, thirdly, international engagement progress on that. I, I think, you know, I think there is progress that is worth uh, remarking there. Um, Johnny alluded to in his opening comments that Somalia is a, a unique blend of internationalism really. Um, it's been quite experimental in many ways. We have the African Union doing the fighting. We have the European Union paying a lot of their costs. We have the United Nations giving them the logistic support to do that and also the political mandate from the Security Council. It's quite a, yes, yeah, quite an innovative uh, model. Um, sometimes it's as streamlined as a sort of Heath Robinson uh, type machine. Um, but, but, you know, it's working. It's delivering uh, the, the results that were hoped for and expected. Um, that's unique on that side. And then I think there is a second unique bit which has come into play last September in Brussels when the New Deal Compact was finalized, which is the first all-embracing, fully comprehensive New Deal based on the Busan principles of partnership between a, uh, a fragile state and the donor community. Um, again, sort of progress is being made on that. The architecture is there. The funding mechanisms are now being established. A multi-partner trust fund for the World Bank, a multi-partner trust fund for the UN. They are about to come on stream. They will, the World Bank have at least 200 million, I think, identified for the initial tranche of their fund. This will then start funding flagship uh, projects which the government has uh, identified. And at last, I hope that people will then start to see, you know, see where, you know, where the beef is, uh, if that's not offensive to vegetarians like me in the room. Um, but, you know, the, yeah, there has been a period of frustration of setting up the architecture and the committees and the work plans for the New Deal and not much tangible product coming from it. That, I hope, is about to change over the next few, few months. Um, more progress, economic uh, and uh, financial governance. Let me very briefly touch on that. There have been issues, as I say. You know, this is a state with weak institutions, uh, prevalent corruption over the last two decades, um, and uh, yes, a, an economy that has been very, very uh, vibrant but completely un 
regulated. Um, virtually no taxes apart from the duties at the Mogadishu port, etc., etc. Um, there is now a, a finance minister who was in Washington for the spring meetings a couple of weeks ago, uh, finance minister Halani, comes with experience and also experience of running Save the Children East Africa for a couple of years. He's got very good work plans for introducing, for example, taxation, which will make him probably the least popular man in, in Mogadishu, but uh, very popular in, in Washington uh, and, and elsewhere, and is, is obviously clearly the right thing to do, uh, and is working very closely with the World Bank, the IMF, and uh, the African Development Bank on a financial governance committee, which is a novel structure to ensure uh, improved financial governance and public financial management. It's, it's a new mechanism that came about after the crisis caused by the resignation of the former central bank governor, uh, but it is showing uh, encouraging signs uh, of being a valuable way of creating the better environment that we need. Perils, I mentioned at the beginning, let, but let me just rapidly go through my, my notes on those. I mean, we're not, not very short of them. Um, I think, and I was saying to, to Johnny before, before this meeting as well, I think one of the biggest perils and one of the messages that I've been sort of giving here in, in Washington to State Department colleagues and will be giving in New York again tomorrow is the peril of international community uh, taking its eye off the ball on Somalia. Yes, there are many, many competing crises and... Uh, and uh, areas for attention, whether it's Central Africa Republic, South Sudan, Syria, Ukraine, whatever. Clearly, Somalia is not up in that category of headline generating day-to-day -day news. Um, but I do worry that if you know, the international interest visibly drops, then not only will resource mobilization drop, and it does need resourcing, uh, but also, it will give space and latitude to Somali uh, politicians and leaders, perhaps, to revert to some of their less uh, attractive and uh, productive uh, ways of behaving. Um, so I think it requires senior international attention, visits, continued high-level meetings, and there will be one in Copenhagen in November, hosted by the Danish government at ministerial level. Um, and it needs continuing messaging from our uh, international political leaders, not just encouraging the government, not just reassuring Somalis, but both of those are important, but at times also giving quite pointed messages, I think, to those who might seek to spoil uh, the progress that is being made. Um, politically destabilizing the government. Um, peril, second peril, one of the sharks currently nearest the boat is, uh, is the humanitarian one. Um, just over two years ago, two and a half years ago, Somalia was in the headlines because of the dreadful famine. Nearly 500,000 people, half a million people died. We are not in that position now. Food security has, has recovered. However, it's showing worrying signs now and indicators of potential food insecurity. Um, some of it related to the offensive that's happened, displacement of people. We don't know the impact that that will have had on planting or harvesting. There is a climatic element always in these Two, and there is also the element of Al-Shabaab blockading food supplies to, uh, to towns. Um, all of that, there is a worst case scenario, could in the next two to three months um, lead to severe uh, food problems. All of that against the background, as I said in the first peril of international attention slipping and most demonstrably it slipped in terms of funding for the humanitarian activities in Somalia. Um, the consolidated appeal for the humanitarians this year is 933 million dollars 
as of yesterday, only $111 million had been found. So that's about 12% funding. WFP, others are uh, laying off staff, closing down operations to some extent because they don't have the funding. All of that, as I say, in a context where we don't know, but in two or three months' time, we may be faced with a severe food um, insecurity issue. Uh, so I am concerned that uh, humanitarian uh, risk is a, is a peril. We, we forget sometimes you know, the scale of the humanitarian needs in, in Somalia. It's linked to the poverty, the conflict, etc. But you know, on any one day there's at least 50,000 children who are severely undernourished and at risk of death. It is about one of the worst countries in the world to be a child. Your life expectancy is, is very low. And, with, um, and uh, currently the UN is feeding still just over one million people every day in Somalia. Um, so. It's, it is easy to forget that some of these figures, as I say, would, you know, would cause shock horror headlines where they in other countries, in the case of Somalia, people have become a bit immured to, to this, um, but it's an ongoing humanitarian need. Uh, third peril I can think, and that's probably my peril more, but maybe others, is, is not thinking ahead. And uh, we do, I mean, it is easy, it's linked to that uh, sort of what I just said, people become immured to sort of Somalia, we get a little bit trapped into same old, same old, you know, this is, this is a sort of persistent, ongoing country with problems of governance, security, etc., etc. Sometimes you can't spot the opportunities uh, when they happen uh, and you can't, and you're not ready to exploit them. And I think we are potentially in that situation now with the transformation of the military peace with the government extension of authority to, as I say, 10, soon to be maybe 25 new districts and towns. And we are not necessarily in as good a shape as we should be in order to exploit those opportunities of delivering effect, stabilization effect for the population in these places simple things like enabling the government to be able to visit. Um, they can't go to these places unless they have air transport, mostly helicopters, uh, and as I said earlier, we don't have enough of those, they don't, you know, really sh short supply. Um, so more funding for the federal government to be mobile and to be able to get around its country is definitely needed. Um, final peril, I think, for me, Personally, um, but more widely, I think is for the international community, is getting the security balance wrong, making a miscalculation on the security. What do I mean by that is that um, I am deeply conscious that if we make the if we make a mistake in our security presence and posture and suffer a significant attack, um, particularly on the UN, this is likely to lead to us withdrawing from Somalia. It's not uh, so, uh, you know, we are only sort of tentatively to some extent on the ground in Mogadishu. We're exposed. June the 19th, we had a UN compound attacked. We lost some colleagues in it and the agency's funds and programs since June have been largely based back in Nairobi and uh, not on the ground in Mogadishu. We're about to reverse that and to, to reintroduce the agency's funds and programs on the ground. But I'm of course deeply conscious that you know that runs a risk and uh, there are scenarios in which uh, you know, if we take further significant losses, um, then that would have a strategic effect on our, uh, on our mission. Um, we lost two colleagues uh, just over a week ago, two weeks ago, in uh, Galkayo, who were assassinated uh, at uh, Galkayo Airport. Again, another harsh reminder of the fact that this is a fairly lawless uh, place in which we operate, um, and our UN colleagues are you know, doing so every day at some uh, personal risk. 
Um, so we have to measure our presence. I encourage other member states to be present in Mogadishu more and more, and I've encouraged the US to be present there as well, but at the same time as thinking and believing that it is right that we should be there, that we should stay, that we should hold our nerve, that we should accept the risks. I'm also deeply conscious that you know, there are risks and uh, you know, if we get hit very badly then it might, uh, it might have an impact. So there we are, those are some perils that uh, keep me going. The, so what do we do? Uh, we, keep, we keep to the plan. We have a very good plan. Uh, we have a, a very good mandate from the Security Council for the UN Assistance Mission in Somalia. We should continue to, to back that, support that. It's up for renewal in June for its uh, second year. Uh, we have the New Deal Compact, which is a good uh, framework. We should stick with that and make that work and make sure that we deliver through it in the next uh, few months, particularly financially. Um, and we have a good, robust AMISOM security operation and presence, and we need to back that and fund that and keep that sustained as well. So, essentially, we do plan A. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Nick, thank you very much for giving us a very broad and comprehensive update on developments uh, in, uh, in, in Somalia. Uh, I know that we have a large audience with us today and there will be lots of questions. Uh, I'd uh, like to start off the uh, discussion uh, by uh, asking several uh, of my own. Uh, and the first one uh, pertains uh, to, to, to neighbors. Uh, can you uh, give uh, us uh, some indication of the uh, ongoing political and security uh, relationships uh, that exist between Mogadishu and, uh, and Kenya, uh, Ethiopia, uh, Djibouti, uh, and how are those uh, relationships uh, evolving? Uh, both on the uh, political and the security side. Uh, sure, yeah, John. Um, I think the the regional relationships are absolutely vital. I mean, as we know, over the past, it's uh, the, the, well, anywhere, the neighbours are quite important. Um, they have a capacity for good or ill. Um, currently. I think the relationships are actually really very strong uh, and particularly noteworthy in the last few months, I guess, is the, the strengthening relationship with Ethiopia, uh, which has led to, enabled the incorporation of Ethiopia into the Amazon forces. Quite sort of controversially, extraordinarily, to some extent, I suppose, given the history of Ethiopian engagement in Somalia, which has not always been happy or, or well received uh, by Somalis. I think there has been a strategic change in approach, both from Ethiopia and from the government in Somalia uh, to each other, uh, and I think that's very positive. I think they are both now very committed to working for achieving stability in Somalia, Somali-led stability, Somali-led government, uh, and the, uh, Ethiopia sees it very much in its strategic interest to have a strong, stable uh, Somalia. Um, so, so I think that's, that's encouraging. What is, of course, again, unique about sort of the Amisom thing is that in defiance of often normal practice, it's not normal sometimes for neighboring countries to take part in peacekeeping missions within neighboring countries, AMISOM is more or less entirely constituted by, by neighboring countries, Kenya, Ethiopia, Djibouti. Um, uh, and it seems to be, seems to be a, a successful thing. EGAD playing a, a role, I'm very glad to say that EGAD now have a very, a special envoy, re reasonably recently appointed, Ambassador Mohamed Afi, who's now being very active on the, on the political file uh, supporting Prime Minister last week in Kismayo trying to take forward the implementation of the, the Juba agreement 
and I think it's very welcome that EGAD are, are, are taking a, a leading, supporting role um, for the federal government on that. Kenya, Kenya is, I mean, we know Kenya is an important uh, partner. Um, headlines dominated recently, obviously, by the detentions and uh, returns of uh, Somalis uh, from Nairobi. Um, and certainly from the UNHCR point of view, we've expressed our, our concerns uh, about uh, the manner of some of those detentions and the need for strict compliance with international law and practice and that refugees should certainly not be uh, deported. Those with refugee status in, uh, in Kenya should have the right to be refugees in Kenya. Um, but Can I ask you about another neighbor? Uh, and that's uh, the uh, regional government of Puntland. Uh, there is a uh, new president there, uh, <coughs> President Abdullahi, who had formerly been uh, a prime minister uh, in the previous transitional federal mm -hmm. government. Former President Faroli has uh, stepped aside uh, there. What is the relationship between uh, Somalia and Puntland these days uh, with, uh, uh, with President Abdullahi? Uh, yes, great, Johnny. Um, I mean, certainly in my in my lexicon or whatever, Puntland is not a neighbour of, uh, of of Somalia. Um, it is a, <laughs> Puntland is not secessionist. It is a, it is a it is a a part of Somalia, and it is in the process of trying to agree and come to sort of settlement on the nature of that federal relationship between itself and uh, and, and Mogadishu. Um, and I think it's encouraging at the moment, as you say, with President Abdiwali Gass there, with his background as a national politician, a federal politician, possibly even a future, you know, vision of returning to a national federal role at some stage. But I think what that means is that he is very interested in, in getting the Puntland Mogadishu relationship uh, back on track. Um, and I'm you know, encouraged, I think the Prime Minister is intending to visit quite soon, which will be taking a senior ministerial delegation, uh, possibly the Speaker, also Parliament, and really getting down to, to business with, uh, with Puntland about how uh, they, they can relate to each other. It's a conversation that the whole of Somalia, in the end, needs to, to have. Obviously, this is the heart of federalism. You know, what is the share of revenue, competences, resources, etc., uh, between the centre and the federal member states? Uh, Puntland is the most advanced in terms of being a proto-federal member state. Uh, so I guess they're likely to lead the way on that, on that conversation. Let me, before we open this up, let me ask you one other uh, larger question, and that is, uh, what is the uh, continuing appeal uh, in uh, Somalia uh, for uh, al-Shabaab? Uh, who joins al-Shabaab uh, these days, uh, and uh, why are they able still to continue to uh, bring in recruits? Good, uh, good question. Um, probably we still collectively don't understand uh, the phenomenon as well as we, we should. Um, certainly the United Nations has no sort of, no intelligence capability here, no sort of, you know, ability to, to look behind the scenes or, and understand these things as some member states might be able to. Um, I mean, my, my, my general sense is that uh, they have relied on a combination of uh, some coercion, some intimidation, also some sort of economic uh, opportunity that they offer to people who don't have any other sort of economic opportunity or opening. Mixed into that, there will be some local politics where you know, potentially 
along clan lines or others, there is a sort of interest in, in supporting them. Numbers, though, I don't think are, there's no evidence numbers are growing. Um, one would intuit that numbers will be reducing, particularly under the pressure that they are now. The Amazon figure that I've always seen is 5,000. It stayed relatively static at 5,000. 5, so I think, hey, not a, not a huge number uh, of people, but I think that's probably a guesstimate. Many of those will be foot soldiers who are probably eminently persuadable when the time comes to, uh, to rehabilitate. We've been putting some emphasis in the UN to support the government in establishing rehabilitation centers for disengaged uh, combatants. There is one in Mogadishu, one in uh, Baidoa, one in Bella Twain, and shortly one in Kismayo, uh, where, yeah, so the, the people can be disengaged. They're screened for those who have you know, serious security concerns. They go through the uh, judicial system, uh, emerging judicial system in Somalia. Those who are of less concern go into the rehabilitation center, are trained in a, in a skill, a vocational skill. Um, so, yeah, that's Al Shabaab. But I mean, I'm very, very convinced that eventually there will be a political discussion to be had. Um, mm -hmm. Some of Al Shabaab, the hardest of the hard, may never be open to, to that kind of discussion, but I'm sure some others will be. I'm not sure the time is, is right at the moment, um, but I'm sure the assembled knowledge and wisdom in the room will attest to the fact that just about most conflicts end in some kind of political settlement. Nick, if you don't mind, we're going to open this up to, to the audience. We've got one question here on the left-hand side. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm uh, Dave Buffalo, I'm military advisor in the I.O. Bureau over at State. Um, for uh, rule of law, uh, when al-Shabaab controlled territory, it established the rule of law at the, uh, by imposing its radical form of Islam uh, at the end of a Kalashnikov. And in order for Somalia to establish a rule of law, it requires police and courts and prosecutors and judges and jails, all five um, relatively uncorrupt and relatively efficient. Um, now, if we, and by we I mean the Somali federal government, along with AMISOM and UNSOM and the international community, uh, don't help establish that rule of law in these newly liberated areas, or even in the areas where they've been liberated for quite some time in the larger cities, uh, we will lose the people by replacing al shabaab control with chaos. I was wondering, what, what are we doing to help uh, focus on the rule of law and what could or should we be doing? Thank you. Thank you. Good. I want to take a couple. A couple, yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, again, sir, for front row. Yeah. And I would ask that everyone keep their questions as succinct as, uh, as possible and make them questions and not so much speeches or commentary. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador King. Uh, my name is Abdel Halim Rujal. I work for the Digital Outreach Team, uh, U.S. Department of State, uh, working on the CV uh, in regard of uh, Somalia and counterterrorism. Uh, I have two questions. First one, you mentioned about the realism hat and uh, to be honest, uh, it's very, extremely, very difficult to see the vision 2016 and doing the uh, national uh, elections. Uh, so what is your uh, assessment and what is your strategic uh, movement if that's not the case? Specifically, there's uh, a lot of uh, the Somalis in diaspora, they are talking about the, uh, the notion of Somalia uh, going under the trusteeship of IGAT. That's the what we see on the social media. My second question is in regard of a Somali-American uh, gentleman who was the president of Hilman al Hib, Mr. Ti, who is in prison in Belgium. And um, I know his family very well, and I speak with them, uh, five children and his wife, they are suffering. He's in prison uh, because of the case of, uh, uh, I don't understand what's going on there. He's, he's not charged as the head of the Somalia uh, the UN Somalia office and special representative, do you have um, uh, any intake into that or any consideration 
uh, you know, uh, talking to the, uh, the Belgian uh, authorities and know what, where his case is going on. Thank you. We'll take those two questions. Come. Right. Yes, great. Uh, uh, rule of law and what to be done about that. Uh, and whether Al Shabaab sort of dispense better, better justice or more sort of accessible justice. Um, yeah, um, I think the immediate challenge is um, in the newly recovered areas, um, where it's obviously important that there should be some reasonable administration and rule of law in the aftermath of uh, al-Shabaab leaving. The stabilization plan that the government has drawn up is actually one which relies a lot on uh, using a traditional justice systems and looking for traditional uh, leaders in those areas to, to dispense justice to begin with rather than to sort of have a five-star um, proper sort of justice system imported from which isn't either politically acceptable or in fact practicable in, in any ways. Um, so we are just now trying to build up the picture of what's actually happening on the ground in these, in these 10 uh, newly accessible areas. Um, but the initial reports seem to suggest that you know, using a combination of traditional elders um, and administrators who have been there uh, and the Somali National Army and Amazon presence, at least in the immediate aftermath, you know, law and order is being uh, maintained. Uh, there is a need quite quickly for the training of police uh, in these places. And again, the plan there is to try to train locally uh, recruited police, police who have been probably fulfilling this role one way or another anyway, and just require some professional development rather than training hundreds in Mogadishu and sending them out to, to the regions. Uh, so that's the immediate challenge there. Back in Mogadishu for the federal sort of justice system, yes, the, you know, there's a lot of work that's needed there. We're beginning our rule of law security institutions team in the, in the mission is one of our biggest teams. Uh, they are certainly providing a lot of strategic advice and technical assistance to to the judiciary, to the corrections uh, facilities and the ministries. Um, but uh, you know, this, is, this is going to take quite a while. Um, but, uh, and there's some fundamental legislation that still needs to be put in place too, the Judicial Services Commission. This is unfortunately, Parliament has a list of about 16 draft bills that it, for some for one person or another, each of those draft bills is a high priority, um, and they need to get through them in this parliamentary session. Um, but this is a parliament that has only managed to get through four laws in the last 18 months. So again, it's, it's very ambitious. Uh, but you know, prioritization will, will be necessary. Um, uh, the uh, elections and EGAD trusteeship. I have not heard anything about EGAD trusteeship, but then I probably don't follow the same social media as, <laughs> uh, as, as you do. Um, it, what is the plan? Uh, the plan, as I say, plan A is definitely plan A, and that is elections in 2016. In the draft uh, framework of action for Vision 2016 from the federal government, in that it does acknowledge that potentially for security reasons, elections may not be possible in all the territory. Um, and so you know, there will then need to be alternative arrangements made for those areas where security doesn't permit elections. Uh, at this stage, two and a half years out from that, it's impossible to predict you know, how much of that the territory will or won't be under government control. You know, if you extrapolate from the last six weeks, then you know, dramatic progress has been made, and by 2016, it, it, you know, it shouldn't be a problem. Uh, but uh, you know, we don't know. So I think the planning is certainly to plan on elections everywhere, but to be realistic and know that for some areas it may not be possible and some alternative mechanism might, might be needed. Hugely challenging, though. I mean, this is, as I said at the beginning, 
if a country was going to be doing any one of the three things that Somalia has decided to do, um, you know, any one of those things would be a major challenge. Uh, holding elections in a country that's not had elections since the late 60s is a big challenge. Um, uh, I mean, and you unpack what holding elections means. I mean, it's got certainly important issues to do with political parties. There isn't a law, there aren't any political parties. There has to be a law establishing political parties, highly fraught issue, you know, will they, what will the role of clan, what will the role of religion be in those political parties, will they be allowed to, in, a, in any way, uh, and the regional dynamic, will they be regional or national political, I mean, there's a lot, uh, a lot yet to, to sort out there. Um, overall, I'm, so I'm, I still think that Somalia, I mean, it sounds sort of huge generalization and potentially culturally uh, condescending of me to say it, but my, my general sense is that Somalis are actually well adapted to this kind of thing. Uh, after 23, four years of, of fighting, I think psychopolitically people have turned the page and they don't want to fight anymore, um, and particularly the younger generation do not. Um, Somalis love discussion, they love language and words and argument, um, and you know, I think are well suited to a you know, result, resolution of problems by political processes. They have many traditional approaches to, to reconciliation and to dispute resolution, uh, which have worked you know, throughout the years in one way or another. Um, sitting under a tree and solving the problem is something which many Somalis will say, just leave us to do that and we will and we will do it. As I say, hugely culturally condescending of me, it sounds to s say that, but I do think there is something psychopolitically there which is grounds for uh, optimism and, uh, and encouragement. Um, and the last minute as well, again, timetables sort of, <laughs> I mean, they, Somalia, and many countries are able to do things at very short notice and last minute, but Somalia are particularly good at sort of getting up to the, uh, to the wire uh, and then pulling off what seems to be impossible um, in a very, very short time. So I still think there is a chance to do that. Sorry. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> we're going to go back and forth. Uh, Jim, you had your hand up first, and we'll take the... DOD and uh, co-conspirator with Ambassador Carson on a number <laughs> of issues. Uh, question about the Somali diaspora. At various times in the past two decades, you can see it's either been a positive influence or a complicating factor. There is influence and resource issues there. Is, this, is there a strategy for engaging the diaspora, whether in the Gulf or in Europe or North America, and what might the components of such a strategy be. Thank you. Okay, we'll take one. Gentleman in the uh, blue shirt here. Go back and forth across the aisle. Hi, Doug Brooks, um, consultant. Uh, my question is on the security sector reform, and uh, can you give us an update on, on who's doing it and uh, how it's going, and uh, are the troops and police being properly paid and, and, and equipped and so on? Okay, we'll take those two. Okay, um, and I uh, also remember the Human and Heb uh, question as well, which I certainly take note of, and I'm afraid I'm not at all cited on what former president uh, of this uh, region is doing in prison in Belgium, but um, I, will, I will ask my, my colleagues, but it doesn't sound probably like a UN uh, issue, uh, but I will inform myself about it. Um, diaspora, yes, the importance of the diaspora, uh, and is there a strategy? <sighs> hmm. I mean, yes, the Somali diaspora is, I think, a very, a very distinct and important phenomenon. Um, there's no doubt uh, that, what is it, about a third of the population now of Somalia is outside of Somalia, three million or so. Some are very concentrated in specific areas, some very successful. Um, in terms of engaging them, Certainly, I don't know that I have a strategy, but I make a point of, 
of doing that. I've had meetings in Minnesota and in uh, London and in Nairobi and in Abu Dhabi uh, recently last week with Diaspora. I think it is important to, to, to talk to them and, uh, and hear. Um, I mean, to some extent, running through my mind with the diaspora is always a sort of a question of di a dichotomy. Um, th there's sort of two schools of thought, two versions. Of the diaspora are either a force for, for change, for, for good. They've got modern approaches and modern exposure to institutions, ways of doing things, uh, and are a great asset and resource for, for their country. Um, particularly in the economic and governance sort of areas. Uh, that's the good, that's the progressive, and there's certainly plenty of evidence of that with young diaspora returning uh, to Mogadishu and playing important roles. Um, then there is the other uh, version of a diaspora, which is often the case in diaspora communities, that they become actually a little bit stuck in time and actually a little bit more extreme and fixed in their views than the communities back in, uh, back in their home country. Uh, so that clan, for example, I don't know, runs deeper and the clan fueling, feuding and uh, divisions sometimes seem to exist deeper in the diaspora and they fund that back in and f inflame it back in Somalia in ways which are unhelpful, I guess, uh, and more exaggerated than the communities on the ground. And very often based, of course, on slight misinformation, or Chinese whispers, rumors, you know, stories that, that have changed and exaggerated in the telling between you know, an incident that happens, let's say, in... Uh, in Bosasa, and by the time it's retold in Minneapolis, it's a, it's a very different story and a very different thing. So, uh, so I think they can. It's 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 a mixed thing. We are going to have a bigger set of issues again. It links to the question earlier about elections. I mean, there is a decision for the Somali Parliament and people as well. Will the diaspora have a vote? Um, and that's, you know, so it goes to, you know, there has to be a citizenship law and then a election law that specifies the suffrage for elections. Um, I, I'm not sure how that's going to be. It's certainly not, my, not my, my, my decision, but it would be interesting to see how that one plays out. Uh, sorry, security sector reform, who's doing it? Um, the answer is um, lots of people are doing bits. Um, this is not a country like, say, Afghanistan or Sierra Leone, where there's been a single framework nation or single framework organization. You can say, you know, they are doing the army, they are doing the police. Um, in Somalia, it's, it's blessed with a number of partners um, doing little bits, uh, which puts a great onus on the need for coordination federal government-led coordination in the spirit of the New Deal compact. Uh, UNSOM's role is to support the federal government in doing that coordination. So we uh, run the sort of secretariat for a lot of, uh, a lot of working groups and committees that are tasked to coordinate security sector, the defense working group, which is subcommittees, training working group, logistics working group, etc., and the police uh, thing. So, there's a lot of um, coordination necessary when there are so many different actors doing, doing little bits. It's a concern to me because I don't think when you add up all the little bits, they yet add up to a sufficient whole. Um, you know, this is an under-resourced area, I think, essentially. Building a new Somali National Army, Somali police, is, is a costly, will be a costly process. And at the moment, I don't think internationally we have uh, gathered sufficient resources to, to do that. I think it would be timely for a stock taking of the plans and strategies that were agreed at the London conference last May, um, good strategies and plans, 
uh, and it would be worth now taking a stock take of you know how far have we got, where are the gaps, what are the blockages, what more is needed, uh, and that probably needs to be done by a smaller group of countries, those who are most directly involved in it. And uh, those who are most directly involved in it, for example, on the, on the military side, is uh, the United States, European Union, uh, the UK to some extent, Turkey, UAE, um, probably forgotten some others, but uh, there will be some bilaterals as well. Italy, I think, also play a bit. So you can see it's you know, at least half a dozen, and some of them not comfortable bedfellows either, or I mean, not traditional bedfellows. So you know, the UAE is more accustomed to doing things slightly, uh, slightly uh, on its own. Uh, some of the others, uh, including the US, um, very uh, focused on what they're doing, and uh, and uh, others, perhaps the European Union, uh, whatever. Anyway, it's uh, <laughs> it's it requires a bit of coordination, uh, which is which is happening. Um, paying uh, is a better story. Um, the army uh, has been paid by Turkey um, for the last. Nine months now, really. They had a brief pause. They've just started again. And this is a bold move. Turkey giving direct funding to, to the central bank, direct budget support for funding the uh, army salaries, um, most of which are being received. I mean, there is sometimes a delay. Um, the, but uh, most of it gets through. So that's an important thing. There is a process of doing a biometric sort of uh, registration and payment system, but that's not yet in place. Uh, others have been funding some of it. Uh, Italy as well have done, a, done quite a lot on the uh, stipends for the, for the army. Uh, police too um, being recruited. We as UNSOM are uh, helping support recruiting 2,400 new police this year, and again with a biometric payment system in place. Payments in general, I mean, again, it's sort of, you know, progress is happening. Civil servants are now being paid um, through special financing facility funded by Norway, which goes again into the central bank, and civil servants are identified, registered, and are paid against a biometric uh, payment uh, system. One of the first uh, flagship programs for the multi-partner trust fund that the World Bank is establishing will be the same sort of payment system for teachers. Um, and that will be reinforcing a UNICEF-supported uh, program called Go to School, which is aiming at enrolling a million children in school and has already started with about 200, 250,000 since it began in September as well as recruitment of a significant number of teachers and the opening of new school buildings for the first time across Somalia, uh, first time since 1991. And these schools are in South Central as well as in Puntland and Somaliland. So when we add on to that the biometric payment of the, the teachers, um, then, you know, we should, uh, yeah, we should always remember that despite all those perils, despite all those challenges, security, lack of capacity, corruption, etc., etc., despite all of that, you know, progress is being made, can be made. And along lines which we've all worked on in many other countries, you know, a lot of the sort of things, the solutions that are coming, biometric payment systems, etc., uh, you know, are things which were introduced in Afghanistan, in, in other countries, in the DRC, we've been through that sort of chain of payments and things, it's, you know, the international community collectively has got a lot of experience, positive and successful experience, of helping states recover from conflict and fragility. Um, and we need to, you know, we need not to be too downcast. I mean, we, you know, we know how to do this. We've seen it done before. It can be done. We're going <clears> to <throat> take a, a, a couple of more questions from both sides and then try and wind down. Alan, you had a question, the gentleman in the brown uh, jacket, too, on this side, and then we'll come to get to over here next. I'm Alan Golty from the Wilson Center. 
Uh, Nick, could you say something about how you see the prospects for Somaliland, its relations with the national authorities, and the role of the UNSOM presence in Hargeisa? Uh, Lawrence Freeman, the uh, Africa desk at ER Magazine. The New Deal in the United States was from Roosevelt, and it was very heavily oriented towards infrastructure, economic development, energy, roads, and putting people to work. Could you say something about how this is being done? None of the stuff that you mentioned so far, you mentioned mm -hmm. some financing, World Bank, but are there projects to actually build the roads, the energy, the water, to grow food? I think that this is of primary importance. I think the lack of doing that in South Sudan after separation has proved to be a disaster. The people weren't fed. Mm -hmm. They weren't given jobs. And as a result, the fault lines developed ethnically, but I think it was a lack of dividend and desperation of the people. And if you wanted to feed Shabab, we have to eliminate that desperation. So maybe you could say something about that uh, in terms of economic, the real economic development, not the financial part. Mm, thank you. We'll come back to you. Yeah. Do these two. OK, right, yes, thank you. Alan, Somaliland. Um, Good, uh, good question. And um, I mean, Somaliland, as we all know, is in a sort of unique kind of position where it is uh, deeply entrenched in its own uh, view and claim of uh, independence, uh, but is also singularly not recognized as an independent state by a single other state in the world. Um, so, so the international legal uh, position is extremely clear, um, and every Security Council resolution you know, reaffirms the territorial integrity of, of Somalia uh, and sovereignty of Somalia. Um, but in reality, there is a de facto um, government in uh, in Somaliland, deeply entrenched in its in its uh, personal sense of uh, independence and statehood. Um, I think my, my general sense is that, that that situation is likely to prevail for quite some time. And as Mogadishu and Somalia, South Central, Puntland address its issues of drawing up a new federal constitution, having eventually elections in 2016, all of that will happen with Somalia, Somaliland outside of that, stepping aside, opting out, or whatever. Um, and, uh, and I suspect that that will you know, prevail. Um, that, you know, that said, there are talks uh, brokered by Turkey going on, and they're being institutionalized with permanent secretariat in Ankara for both Somaliland and Somalia. Uh, and those talks. Uh, are looking at areas of mutual interest, uh, um, more of a technical level. They may progress to, to more political uh, level discussions as well. And I think it's good that that, you know, that process is happening. And it's very good that the Turkish government is putting the time and effort into supporting that. Um, for UNSOM, uh, I have to say I've been to Somaliland once. Um, shortly after I began the mission uh, back in June, July last year. Very good visit to Hargeza, very well received and looked after. Saw, you know, the impressive uh, developments that they're making on parliament, governance, their institutions, ministries, etc. Uh, and then I went for a last meeting of the program with President Silanio. Uh, and President Silanio was very polite and very charming, uh, but uh, told me not to come again. Um, uh, because he said, you know, Mr. SRSG, you are the head of the United Nations Assistance Mission in Somalia, and I think you'll find you've got the wrong country. They're, 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 they're next door. Um, uh, and uh, your mandate from the Security Council to, you know, promote federalism, <laughs> constitution, review, <laughs> elections, and things like that, well, you know, how on earth are you going to do that in Hargeza? Why not? <laughs> you know, how dare you think of doing that in Hargeza, etc. Um, and you know, I, I can entirely understand from their end of the telescope why you know why they said that and why they why they felt that. Um, I think it's uh, slightly regrettable because the UNSOM 
does many things other than just the, the support for the political process. We're also supporting security sector reform, rule of law, justice. We're also doing a large amount on human rights, capacity building, as well as monitoring and reporting. All of those things, I would say, would be of relevance and interest, indeed, benefit to, uh, to Hargeza and Somaliland. Um, I think uh, my, my, my hope is that we will, you know, we didn't, we didn't fall out. We, you know, as I say, I respect, uh, I respect their, their view on this. And I think there will come a time when, you know, we will probably sit down and talk it through again. Um, and I'm always very open to, to that conversation. Uh, well, I didn't ask the question about uh, the New Deal and infrastructure. I totally agree. I mean, I, I think it's a huge missing link to some extent component uh, and if you ask uh, President Hassan Sheikh you know what does he want from sort of all this international support and pledges from you know he says well can't can't somebody come and just do you know maybe 30 kilometers of the road from Mogadishu to Afgoy that would make a very big difference you know power station would also help so sort of the port being refurbished would also help uh, he's very very keen on major sort of infrastructure projects and uh, the answer, you know, so far is that neither, you know, that those IFIs who would traditionally do this, World Bank, African Development Bank, are not yet engaged in, in looking at those kind of major projects. But I think, I hope that they will as they become more comfortable with uh, the conditions in uh, Somalia uh, and brings us back to the security again. I mean, World Bank are being very intrepid, I mean, for an international financial institution that finds sort of Washington on a Friday afternoon a bit intimidating. <laughs> I mean, they, they, they are being very intrepid, the World Bank, and are you know, appointing a rep now for Somalia. They're, they're taking office space with us in Mogadishu International Airport, uh, in our camp there, and they are prepared to engage and work on the ground. Uh, not all the other IFIs are so so intrepid yet, um, so it's going to, it's linked a little bit to the security, unfortunately, a little bit then to the perception of the financial governance, public financial management context, etc. Uh, but I think you know they need to they need to change a little bit the dial and and dial up some major infrastructure uh, and economic generating projects. We're running into overtime. We're going to take two questions here, uh, here in the front, and then the gentleman in the blue jacket, blue shirt. Great. My name is Ahmed Shago. I was born in Mogadishu, Somalia. I lived most of my adult life here in the U.S. Thank you, Ambassador, for the hard work. You're doing a good job, I think. Uh, I met you briefly in September in Mogadishu at mm -hmm. the 2016 Vision Conference. And I'm still hopeful. I was part of those uh, folks who worked with the teams that were preparing the report. I'm hopeful that you will do a 2016, some mini elections, if not elections, mm -hmm. uh, the concept of election. My question is, uh, you have touched a very comprehensive work that the UN and international community is doing in Somalia. My question is, is there a program or a, an effort to bring about peace and reconciliation among the tribal groups that there was a civil war after all. And we know that many countries like, there's a model like in South Africa, there was a model after apartheid that mm -hmm. they used to bring folks and heal. We need to heal. And what is the UN doing? What is the international community in general, uh, member, part, uh, member countries doing? Could you touch upon that? Thank you. Sure. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much. I'm Mark Yarnell with Refugees International. Uh, and just a quick question on um, within the, the broader hum humanitarian context and all the challenges there, um, there's still huge numbers of internally displaced people living in Mogadishu. Uh, and, um, and many have been, uh, been evicted as land prices have increased. When I was last there in September, UNHCR was working, trying to work closely with the government to prevent evictions uh, in, that were short nature or short term and, and forcible, and create al an alternative site. I'm curious to know if um, uh, if there's any update on that in terms of finding secure land tenure. Thanks very much. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. I mean, truth and reconciliation. Uh, there, I mean, there, there is interest in it, and from the federal government as well, and Parliament too. They're looking at a truth and a yes, a truth and reconciliation uh, commission and draft law. Um, what I'm not a hundred percent sure about is how universal within Somalia is the appetite for all of this. It's very delicate sort of area, obviously. I think at the moment, uh, the reconciliation that is happening is happening more or less as a part of the federalism process so that disputes and differences need to be reconciled within the, the clan and local 